Welcome to our first live discussion for the Wizards for Environmental Protection campaign. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been posting information um, about how animal products specifically affect the environment and what we can all do to help. Um, so our Forbidden Forest Challenge, if you've been participating, has been going on and we're going to be switching gears to a new one starting tomorrow. And if you haven't already, feel free to put your house in the comments. You're going to get 20 points for your house uh, just for being here. And yeah, um, so we'll also be asking some questions to Charlie. And if you don't know about Trupo treats, you should definitely look them up. They have sustainable uh, vegan chocolate. It's delicious. I've had it quite a few times and they are developing four flavors. Um, they just had a really successful campaign fundraiser and they raised a lot of money. So I'm really excited to get my chocolate. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, first, everyone for, from Protego, we'll just kind of introduce ourselves. Um, I'm the marketing director and I'm a Ravenclaw slash House of the Eagle. Um, yeah. Everybody else, Fiona. Hi. I'm Ali, I'm the Finance and Development Director at the Protego Foundation, and I am a Slytherin, or House of Serpent, um, for the purpose of this campaign. Is that our new thing, Tyler? Well, I thought it could be, I don't know, you know, like Ravenclaw and like badgers and stuff. There's a snake in the like so we like can go. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna be that. We're gonna do this. <laughs> well, I guess since, yeah, Ali alluded to it, I too am a Slytherin, I'm Tyler, I'm the President of the Protego Foundation. And I'm Catherine, um, House of the Lion slash Gryffindor, um, and I'm executive director of the Protego Foundation. Yay. Awesome. I think that's all the Protego people we have. Um, Charlie, and as, as a guest, feel free to introduce yourself and also let us know what your, <clears throat> what your Hogwarts house is, your Patronus, and your favorite magical or non-magical creature. Cool. Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlie. I'm an environmental science student uh, in Scotland right now but I'm, I'm also the owner of Trupo Treats. And my house, I'm torn between Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff, but I think, I think I'm identifying more with Hufflepuff today and, and lately. <laughs> uh, but my Patronus is a Dun Stallion. And my favorite magical creature is probably a Hippogriff. I, I, would, I would have to say Buckbeak probably. So, uh, yes. so yeah. Good choices. I think Hufflepuff makes sense because you make chocolate <laughs> for a living, so it seems like a Hufflepuff thing to do. Yeah, I think I'm like I think I'm like a Hufflepuff on the inside and on my exterior. I'm more of like a Ravenclaw, but you know, it's, it's a, a Raven hard... Puff. Is that what they're called? Yeah. 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 Or would it be a Huffleclaw? Ooh, because your first house or the first part is your okay. main house. I don't yeah. know. That makes sense. That Hufflepuff. Make sense. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds lame. <laughs> no, that's cool yeah I always say I'm Slytherin but you know Ravenclaw rising or like I'm Slytherclaw like Raven or Slytherin's definitely my main house but um but we all have you know pieces of other we have other traits and stuff so I like that today you're feeling like a Hufflepuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah um awesome so I'll just give a little bit I think everyone here knows you know who we are at the as a Protego Foundation for people um, tuning in. So we're a group of activists empowering all magical people to get active for animals. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit animal rights organization. And our goal is um, as a wizarding fandom to be more considerate of the rights, feelings, treatment of all creatures, regardless of species, size, or magical abilities. So basically a lot of Harry Potter fans came together um, to fight for the rights of animals, non-magical and magical. All creatures are magical, but in the wizarding world and the non-wizarding world. <laughs> um, cool. So Charlie, do you want to tell everyone a little bit more about Trupo Treats and Veggie Brothers? Sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> Veggie Brothers is, it's primarily on Instagram and it's, it's I'd call it like a personal blog kind of thing for uh, animal rights. And it started off as kind of a lifestyle account, turned more into, um, we post a lot of animal videos and just try to show compassion towards animals in our videos and try to show that animals are sentient beings who deserve uh, to, to live, essentially. And then 
last July, we created a, a milk chocolate company, but it's all vegan. So um, yeah, and right now we're making a bunch of new chocolate bars. Like we have uh, vegan alternatives to a bunch of the ones that everyone grew up loving. Um, so we have like a vegan alternative to Kit Kat, Twix, Crunch, and Hershey, which is really, really exciting. And that campaign is still going on. Um, and we plan to actually make those in June. So yeah, it's, it's really, really exciting stuff. So thanks for having me on here, by the way. Yeah, we're excited yeah, you're here. Um, so I um, worked a little bit with Troupeau Treats in, in the beginning, helping, you know, find different sanctuaries and everything. And so I've been really fortunate to kind of see you, you grow and everything as an, as an organ or as a business. And um, we also teamed together for those who don't know to create um, the chocolate salamanders for our annual fundraiser. So those are coming out of kind of brainchild of, of Troupeau Treats and Protego um, together. So I don't know if any interesting bits about like the process of, of coming up with those that you want to share. I can talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think actually you're probably more involved in that <laughs> than I am because you and Brian were kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically we, you know, they're in the wizarding world, there are um, chocolate frogs and those are unfortunately not vegan and not being sold as vegan. So we wanted to create something similar, but with our own wizarding flair um, that people, vegan um, people and non-magical and wizarding people <laughs> could experience like the joy of having a chocolate frog. Um, but so we made chocolate salamanders and those are, um, those were being sold for our fundraiser and we're still kind of working out some of the details on, on getting those created the best way possible. Um, they're going to come in like really cool packaging and everything. And hopefully that's something we can kind of grow in the future too. So yeah, that's, that's that. I can't wait for those. <laughs> I'm excited. So, they're going to be so cute and yummy. Yeah, <laughs> it's the perfect thing. And I'm also excited for the Kit Kat version of Troopo Treats. <laughs> yeah, that, those excited. are my favorite. <laughs> All right, so um, just a little bit about our campaign for people who don't know, it is focusing on protecting the environment and in turn all creatures who call the environment home, which is basically all creatures. Um, our goal is to encourage all magical people and even non-magical people to do their part to individually um, just make an impact and together we will all make a huge impact. So we've been uh, making some Wizarding World analogies like with the Forbidden Forest and the Black Lake and just wondering what would happen if deforestation was a problem in the Forbidden Forest or pollution in the Black Lake and how that would affect all of the magical creatures that we love. Um, and unfortunately no spell exists to just reverse climate change and pollution so we want to educate everyone about what we can do in the real world to put a stop to those things. Um, so We'll get into the actual discussion now. Just to start off, um, in general, what are some things that everybody does um, in their day-to-day -day lives just to help the environment? Feel free to speak up or put it in the chat. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be animal related. Um, I think most of us probably try to refrain for the most part at least from consuming animal products, but also do you do you do zero waste or recycle? I try to do that as much as possible. My roommates mm -hmm. and I have been collecting our compost because a lot of compost facilities were shut down because of COVID. But as soon as they yeah. opened up again, we've been collecting and taking compost like every Wednesday and Saturday to our local farmer's market and dropping, oh, that's dropping awesome. that off. Yeah. Wow. I eat out a lot, uh, fast food. And so... <laughs> I found that the amount of straws that are being given out during like fast food and stuff, I just recently started doing this, but I was like, obviously all plastic or all single use plastic is just devastating to, to the environment. And we've all seen videos of, you know, those turtles with like straws stuck in their noses. So I was like, okay, maybe there was something that I could do to reduce the amount of straws that I'm, you know, being given uh, at fast food places. And so I bought a reusable metal straw that I can use. Uh, whenever I go out and, you know, they're always hand me the straw and I'm like, oh no, no, thank you. I have a reusable one. And they're always like, okay, you know, 
it's it's like one of those things where the first time that I did it, I was like, oh my God, they're going to be, they're going to be so mean. They're not going to understand why, you know, it's like when you go to a restaurant and you're looking for like a plant-based option or something and you're like, oh man, they're going to think I'm weird. And honestly, they were just like, okay. So super easy <laughs> and big step, you know, to help reduce, you know, even just a little bit of the plastic that I'm consuming. Awesome. Definitely. Yeah. I also have, um, I just keep it like in my purse. It's a little kit that is like bamboo forks mm-hmm. and like a knife and a spoon and a straw. Um, and I just love like whipping that thing out and using it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if people think I'm weird. I think actually a lot of people, um, I feel like some places even they don't offer straws unless you ask. So it's shifting slowly. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a really, Oh, sorry, Charlie. You go. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, I actually have the same exact thing. I just carry it in my backpack. It's like a little, uh, like a silverware set that I just bring with me. And then I also, I obviously bring this with me places too. And then I also have like this uh, little plastic container that I just bring. If, if I'm just picking up like a, like a cake or like a bagel or something, I just bring that instead of, instead of like a bag or something like that. So. I love that. Yeah, I have a little set of, um, it, it's like to-go containers, but they like fold down. So I'll just, everyone, I mean, it hasn't been during COVID, but like when you have to go food and you like, instead of getting a styrofoam or something that they give you, I just have popped a little thing open and everyone that works at the restaurant's like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. But it makes me feel cool. <laughs> so rad. I see uh, Elizabeth mentioned that they also recycle and use their reusable straw anytime that they can. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I think for me, like I, I mean, not, I I don't really grocery shop anymore at the moment. (laughs) Um, But like, for the longest time, I've been using um, reusable bags. And even like, if I go to a restaurant to pick up takeout, like instead of using their plastic bag or whatever, I like always have one in my purse with me at the very least. (laughs) Um, So much so that like, my friends are like, you're such a bag lady. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's for the environment. So (laughs) Yeah. It's life changing. I I try to avoid like any plastic bag or like, I will not buy like soda bottles or water bottles or anything. I just like refuse now. Um, Yeah. Oh, yeah. And using like a a reusable water bottle. um, Like Mm -hmm. I, I've had like a water bottle that I've been using for like five years. Like it's so much plastic from being put into the recycling or waste system. Like Definitely. This is a a kombucha I had probably about five or six months ago, and I'm still using the the bottle for for water, (laughs) the glass bottle. But um, but yeah, I just I was out and I really wanted like a juice or something, and I was like, let me get a glass one and then just reuse it till I drop it somewhere and it breaks. So that's a huge pitfall for me is is the fact that I do drink a lot of like soda and stuff from like the vending machine, you know that kind of thing. So I'm just like. So that's, that's one area that I would like to continue to grow in during my environmental journey. Tyler, you should look into, I forget what it's called. Charlie might know, because I feel like you would know these things, but there's this like recycling, um, uh, like specifically for, I forget what it's called, but for like, like wrappers and stuff for different things. So like chip bags and like, yeah. um, all of like vending machine sort of things. Like TerraCycle. TerraCycle. That's oh, it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You yeah, like, I have one of those. <laughs> Oh, cool. Um, they're bad. they're pricey, but I finally was like, I'm just gonna get one because it, it was like eighty dollars for like a medium sized box that they like sent me. Um, but I eat so many chips. That's like <laughs> that's like my downfall is all the chip bags. So I'm gonna see yeah. like how many I can stuff in there, and then like how much it costs per chip bag, and if it was like really worth it for me to buy. <laughs> oh, interesting. But TerraCycle is that's a great thing to bring up because they will recycle basically anything Mm -hmm. yeah and like some grocery stores actually partner with TerraCycle um and other locations um like Nature Preserve sometimes do it as well um so yeah I I'm sure they must have like a way to look up where other like locations are other than like you know sending it in yourself yeah yeah I was taking in all of my soft plastic um to a grocery store before COVID but again off when that when everything kind of shifted, they stopped accepting a lot of stuff. So, um, 
I, I should call and see if they're accepting again, but any kind of, you know, if you buy something and it's like plastic wrapped or any kind of, you know, mm. anything like that, um, like bread and stuff, you know, like bread, like those bags, like that, as long as it's yeah. clean. Um, but yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Elizabeth mentioned making your own soda. That sounds advanced. <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> like I'm going to try it. The soda stream. I used to have a soda stream and I loved it. Um, but I, I just always drank like plain seltzer. I never got like the, I think in high school I had like the lemon lime syrup thing, but it just, it was a little too like sugary, I think, but. Um, yeah. I mean, glass, a lot of one, well, not a lot, but like you can even get Coke and stuff like in glass bottles, um, which is better than plastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. There's We're going to a- learn more about that in the next phase of our campaign. <laughs> <laughs> So for now, um, we will jump into our topics. So first up is deforestation, um, which the leading cause of deforestation is animal agriculture, uh, because in order to have space for all of the animals, they need to cut down the forest so they have a place to graze, at least the animals that are lucky enough to be outside at all. Um, And yeah, so that affects all like native animals and also, 70 to 75 percent of soy crops worldwide are fed to farmed animals so a lot of the farmed plants that we're growing are actually just being fed to animals so it's just kind of backwards doesn't make any sense but um our first question that i want to pose to you are where do you think the wizarding community sources its products and materials do you think they use the same industries as non-magical people or do they have their own farms and and things like that this is kind of the dark stuff of the wizarding world you know it's definitely stuff that like the author never thought about but here we are (laughs) like like if we can if we can do really cool things with magic right we as the wizarding community the established wizarding world um it kind of makes me a little bit afraid uh or no let me pose it this way if we could do awful things to animals without magic it makes me concerned about the horrible things that we could do to animals with magic. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to think of like what a wizarding factory farm would look like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can't do like the Gemini spell on food, right? Or, or can you like, you can, can you but do- it, uh, Jiminy, I, I'm pretty sure. Gemini, you can do it. Like the cloning spell. Yeah. <laughs> or- I'm pretty sure you can do it on food. Cause then I feel like that's similar to like lab grown meat. Like you have like one cell and then you just like produce more. Like that would be the smart way to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't do that. Right. I don't know. I, My first know. answer was going to be like, we shouldn't ask the wizards. We should ask the elves used in houses. Cause I feel like wizards, but, but that's also class, you know, cause like Molly Weasley, she doesn't have a house or an elf, you know, in her house to like do everything. So I'm sure she does a lot of like the, the gardening and stuff on her own too and all the I mean don't the Weasleys have like chickens and pigs and in their yard so oh man is Molly Weasley like killing pigs I don't know know. maybe she just likes to have them around but they cook a lot of bacon (laughs) so Um, yeah I mean I feel like they could just go undercover and like source food from where everyone else does but if you could yeah if if they can just duplicate things but i thought there was a some rule that you can't do that with food or is it water you can't create food out of, like uh, i think elizabeth just shared yeah elizabeth just shared in the chat as well uh, gam's law one of gam's laws is that you can't create food out of nothing um but multiplying it you could but to elizabeth's point also in the chat does it retain the same quality? Because didn't Hermione like transfigure like those mushrooms or something in the Deathly Hallows? Or did I like, was that a fan fiction? But she was like trying to like, create more food and like she like trans, she was like doing a spell to make them like better. Um, oh. But then it, they were still like gross. <laughs> I, don't I think that was real. I think that was real. <laughs> we'll find out in a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Join us for a Deathly Hallows book club. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting questions. If if I were ever to meet the author, I'm gonna bombard with these questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know if we want to know the answer. So um 
Okay, moving on to pollution. So toxic waste from humans and factory farms pollutes oceans, rivers, streams, and lakes. Um, slaughterhouses pour 250,000 gallons of toxic wastewater a day directly into water sources. Mm. Um, so not exactly the same, but I was thinking about potions and especially at Hogwarts, like all the students are making all these potions every day in class and what do they, they aren't using the whole thing or they go wrong. So they have to throw it away. What do they do with it is do they banish it or do they have to just like pour it out somewhere? What do you think? Mm. Cause I can't imagine, you know, like draft of living death or something. You just pour that out. Like what, what are the consequences from that? <laughs> yeah and like even if you were to like pour it down a sink it, it like mixing with other unused potions or half-baked potions and that kind of thing what uh what kind of devastating concoctions are being brewed in like the pipes of hogwarts oh and elizabeth says even if it does get banished where does it actually go like is there some plane of existence <laughs> where banished things end up Mm. yeah that's a good question and then nicole comes back with i mean vanished objects go into non-being but it kind of reminds me of like um not only like the issue of toxic waste from farms but also like uh the the processing that goes into making technology um mm. and like how that stuff you know just kind of sits around in, in different places and doesn't get like, it, it can't go anywhere. Um, but yeah, no, that's like a really good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For- Is there ever a scene where like we see them clean up stuff in the Snape, books? Snape vanishes Neville's potion at one point. Yeah. I think Evanesco is the spell that just like vanishes things. And I've seen, I think, yeah, Snape does that with Neville's. And then I feel like Hermione probably does that if someone spills something. I feel like there's a scene where someone spilled something and she just quickly like, you know, um, like vanished it, I guess. But that's interesting. I feel like wizards might, or like the people in the wizarding world might um, produce less waste than like, cause they don't use technology the same way. So like all of like the, you know, what is it necessary obsoletism or some or whatever it's called for like mm-hmm. iPhones and wires and computers and everything, how they just like sit in landfills forever and ever. Like that never happened in the wizarding community. And then they don't use um, like transportation in the same way. So like there's not as much toxic waste and like gas and pollutants to like get rid of. Um, Other than yeah. like the flu powder, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Would you? Yeah. <clears throat> there's no like industrial like uh, smokestack or something. You know, there's <laughs> no wizarding factory pumping out birdie bots. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think there is. That's pretty cool, actually. I feel like maybe wizards are like way more sustainable <laughs> than muggles. I think so. They're kind of forced to be, and it's also a much smaller community, so it wouldn't have the same impact also we see them kind of like suspended in time um you know using like quills and you know vegan quills of course but using all these things and and we kind of see them as living in like a different age and like 100 200 years ago like we weren't consuming the way that we are as a society like now and so a lot of the the waste that we're producing wasn't being done you know back then and that's kind of like where wizards are on like the the plane of, of production, I guess, and capitalism and all that stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think I think an interesting question as well is how do how do they power everything though? Because I, mm. I have an energy class right now, and the energy industry is like a big source of pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So that's also, I guess, another question. Yeah, like how I think for the things? most part. I mean, I read a lot about like, you know, fireplaces going and candles like during like when they're in magical locations, like, but I think they also do use some electricity. It's like a mix. Yeah, because the, the the radios, right? For yeah. the Wizarding Wireless Network, they have to be plugged into something. Yeah. 
but they still call it like I like what is it like I like yeah Mr. Weasley what do you Mr. Can't, Weasley like, can't, can't even pronounce electricity, electricity. yeah like, yeah something like that <laughs> maybe there's like a spell that makes something work like maybe depending on how complex it is or like if yeah. it's just a little object maybe they can magic it to work but as far as like they don't have like a heating system at Hogwarts or like an air conditioning and it kind of sounds like it might be miserable sometimes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like are their radios just like hollow or do they have wires and stuff in them because like or you know like is it yeah. electricity then- or is it just like I guess they could use batteries maybe they but then at that point like twiddling the knobs why would you need to twiddle the knobs when you could just like magic it to your station right mm-hmm. and then at that point why do you need a radio why can't you just use a box <laughs> you know what I mean for aesthetics it's true, <laughs> true. Aesthetics. Wow, yeah, I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of like wizarding world uh theme park stuff and all of the spells that involve light and like lighting lanterns and that kind of thing it's all incendio so it's all fire you know, even Flim yeah. Flam's lanterns in Diagon Alley, it's just incendio. So maybe there's, maybe there's really not electricity in the wizarding world. Yeah, maybe they'd be like more advanced in like wind and solar and, and just kind of like natural um, mm. power, stuff like that, heat, like fire. Yeah. No. Sure. That's one of my favorite spells to do at the wizarding world, <laughs> especially at night, like okay. lighting stuff. It's so cool. Um, Elizabeth said maybe they have a climate control spell, so the castle is always the perfect temperature. Me too, I also James. think, Just like yeah, and like our old, and then we can move on to the next one. Sorry, but old, um, like old magical houses, and like especially like pure blood, like p- houses passed down. And I feel like the castle also, they kind of they start to like they get the magic of like the wizarding people that live there. So I feel like the castle probably just kind of does that on on its own sort of, um, which is interesting. There are a lot of like, um, I've le- read a lot about like magical dwellings and sort of like the power that they have just in like their structure. Um, mm-hmm. And that's pretty cool. Before we jump on to the next uh, topic, Charlie, I would love to hear, you know, we've talked about two different major environmental crises and as a student who's, you know, learning all of this stuff, do, do either of these kind of touch a nerve more for you in terms of like your motivations for wanting to pursue environmental education? Uh, sorry, what was that in terms of uh, was it deforestation or? Or like water pollutants, that kind of thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think, well, I, I focus more on the conservation side. So I would say probably, I would say probably deforestation has the greatest impact because it's happening everywhere. Um, at such a great scale, even in Scotland, where you think of kind of like these beautiful forests, um, Scotland is being deforested at a, a pretty great rate. Uh, there aren't that many connecting forests anymore. Um, forests used to connect the east to the west coast, and now they're just uh, kind of fractioned. So I think that's that's probably one of the, the biggest things for me. Um, and yeah, obviously a forest habitat is important for for ecology and for conservation. So mm-hmm. I would say, yeah, that's probably a greater motivation for me. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's just so great how your company is putting so much emphasis on having sustainable packaging and like ethical workers, like uh, conditions and everything. Like if every big company would do that, the world would completely change. So yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. <laughs> At first, at first with Triple Treats, I wasn't going to actually uh, be on board because at first we, we just used the chocolate that our, our original factory was going to use. And I was, I, I told Brian, I was like, uh, I don't think I can like ethically get myself to do this. But then after, after just thinking about it more, we're like, we have to start somewhere. Um, it's our only option right now because that, that was the only factory willing to, to do it for us. And if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so, but yeah, I'm so happy that we're on the food empowerment project list now. Uh, if you go check their website, we're on there now, which is really, really exciting for me. Um, and yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. 
definitely one of my favorite companies just because you're doing everything right and you donate to the sanctuaries and it's just perfect. <laughs> um, okay, so some things that we can all do to prevent more deforestation and pollution would just be not buying animal products, of course. Um, palm oil is a big one. It's a major cause of the Amazon rainforest being destroyed. Uh, you can report any pollution you might see in your where you live um, to your local council or government. Um, and it's the same with like litter and everything because that all just ends up in the ocean. And support legislation to give legal rights to bodies of water and ecosystems. Um, you can learn more about that on our social. We wrote up about that. And then just tell friends and family about these issues because a lot of people don't really know the facts and a lot of people try to just kind of ignore them as well because they feel like if they if they stop using plastic bags or something, like it won't really make a difference. And it's true that if one person does it, it won't make a difference. But if we all collectively do it, it will. All right. Love that. So moving on um, to animal materials. So animals used for wool, feathers, um, leather, they take up a lot of space. So it's kind of the same issue with the deforestation. Um, but then also animals such as like alligators and snakes, a lot of them are farmed, but some are also taken from the wild, which just disrupts the entire ecosystem because they're apex predators. And then without them, the other species will overpopulate and it just throws off the entire balance. Um, so as far as the wizarding world goes, I'm wondering that creatures who are farmed for potion ingredients, um, they must be a source of waste as well. And like, what does that look like? And then for creatures such as like edema guys, their hair is used for um, invisibility cloaks. But what about the rest of them? Like, I don't think people really eat edema guys. They don't talk about that or dragons. Dragons are massive. And you can just imagine how much food they must have to eat every day. Um, and then parts of them are used like their heartstrings or their skin. But do they just get rid of the rest? Like, I can imagine that there's just a lot of waste that comes from those industries. So if anyone has any thoughts. Yeah, I know that in the non-magical world, there's a lot of waste in any kind of production because usually, I mean, some, some farms partner with other farms, you know, and they once a, an animal is, you know, spent, which is a horrible way to, to put that. But once, you know, a cow who's giving her milk um, for, for dairy can no longer, is no longer producing milk, then usually she's shipped off, you know, to a, a meat farm or something like that. And they, but there's always a lot of parts that go to waste sort of, and they're, you know, they're, that's always been an argument um, when talking about like hunting, because a lot of people who hunt, um, say, you know, they use every piece of the animal and depending on where, you know, that's, we're talking about this, like our society, Western, you know, culture and everything. Um, and I would think that it's probably similar. Like, I want to say again, cause I think of wizards as like in the olden days sort of, and like, they would, I don't really see them having like factory farms. And I think, I feel like it would all be like hunting and kind of using the animal and you know you see like haggard wearing you know a bunch of animal skins and, and furs and stuff and i feel like if he were to like kill an animal for meat to feed to fang or something he would probably use like their pelts and everything like, i feel like it would be a lot more sustainable i guess um but there's probably still a lot of a lot of waste because like unicorn hair for instance for like the wands and then but it's like um it's like the whole drinking you know a unicorn's blood or like using unicorn for like other things is seen as like taboo. So like what is done with the rest of, <laughs> um, so I don't, I think I just asked more questions rather than answer, but. Yeah. I'm trying to, I think one of the, the ways that I've kind of coped with the wizarding world's use of dragons is to be like, okay, maybe the dragons at like the dragon reservation in Romania have all passed away. And then they're like, cutting up their bodies and like using them in various different ways. 
Um, I don't know if defacing the, you know, the dead body of, of somebody is, is better or not, but I have to imagine that there's, there's gotta be a good way and a bad way that the wizarding world is doing everything, right? Just like in our world, there's the good way and there's the bad way. And so I do wonder if there are people who are trying to, I'm I'm trying to think out loud, but who are trying to industrialize animal products like is the apothecary in Diagon Alley sourcing you know the beetle eyes from just somebody going out you know and, and harvesting them or is there some kind of like giant corporation like wizarding corporation that's out there I don't I don't really know I don't know I didn't really answer any of the questions but yeah well once again do you think they they could just create more like if there was some demi guy's hair couldn't they just like duplicate it or make it bigger or um but at that rate if if that's the standard practice then i feel like it wouldn't even be called demi guy's hair at at that point if it's mm. just become a material um not related to an animal but demi guys are hunted right for that purpose so yeah and that gets into like the whole duplicating if that messes with like the efficacy of, of the ingredient. Cause I feel like for potions, they're already very like volatile. So they might not want to do something like that. Cause it could like in baking or something, you know, it's similar. It's all chemicals and um, it has to be like perfect amounts of, of everything. So I don't know. Interesting questions. I know this fascinates me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, but I like to think that they can find some alternate alternate um, things to use. Like in our world, you can buy faux fur, faux leather, even faux wool. Like there's really no excuse to be buying the animal product. At this mm-hmm. point. So, so um, I'm going to jump into um, the idea of fishing. And I know we wanted to keep this to an hour. So I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit, not that it's any less important than all the other (laughs) topics. Um, But so globally, large scale industrial fishing boats drag in as many as 2.7 trillion wild caught fish in a year. Um, But then in all of these industrial fishing um, methods, there's a lot of what is called bycatch. And so that's basically, you know, like sharks, turtles, dolphins, just any other sea animal um, is caught kind of Uh, collateral damage, sort of, so to speak. Um, And a lot of them are endangered or at risk. And so there's a lot of danger in this like overfishing. Um, And phytoplankton, um, who are the food source of many of these aquatic species are also heavily affected. And so again, it's it's that disruption of the ecosystem and disruption of kind of the natural um, world for these animals. And aqua farms are destructive as well. And and they produce a large or a large amount of pollution from waste in the water. And um, the fishing industry also pollutes our oceans with around 640,000 tons of plastic nets, lines, and traps every year. Um, And those don't just, you know, trap the fish that, or the crabs or whoever, you know, whichever um, species the the fishing um, companies are trying to catch. It also affects um, all the other species in the water. Um, So, um, one of the questions is, do you think wizards would also hunt these populations to depletion? Um, and I think we kind of touched on that just with, um, talking about animal materials. Like we like to think that, um, things would be done a little bit differently. Um, but it's kind of hard. (laughs) It's kind of hard to say. And then, um, some ways that we can avoid and prevent overfishing in the, um, non-magical world is avoid purchasing seafood or sea animal products. Um, and, um, also really important there, are, um, areas called no catch zones and we can campaign our government for those. Um, if anyone has anything else to add about that, feel free. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I kind of wanted to ask Charlie as you know, you're going to school for this. When I first heard these statistics, I was blown away because, you know, we, we all go through different science classes in school and and that kind of thing where we're taught all these different ways to help the environment and how the environment is affected at least in my school that's how we did but this was never something that was really brought up so I wanted to know is this a topic that is being discussed 
in some of the classes that you're um, that you're participating in? Are they, you know, talking about the negative effects of animal agriculture or fishing with all these plastic nets and lines and traps every year? Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting question, and I have a class this year where we have gone over uh, fishing, but then. We had a guest speaker come in and talk about sustain, sustainable fishing. And I actually asked a question related to this of, um, you know, if, if, if such a high percentage of fish stocks in the ocean are being depleted, then why are we still fishing if we don't need to? And then they always go back to um, like low income communities need um, fish and, and places um, like a lot of Asian communities rely on fish. And I think that's a fair point, um, except I was referring more so to the UK because obviously we don't need to eat fish over here, but they just keep going back to other communities. Um, so they don't, we, we, we do hear about it, but, and the issue is, a, is addressed, but there's never a solution to it. They kind of leave it up in the air and tell you sustainable fishing. Um, they even told you to eat fish, just eat them with this, special tag i think it's called like a red tag maybe um but yeah i think in my other years i did have a class that talks about animal agriculture as well and it was kind of a similar thing i felt like my lectures were actually probably had some roots to farming in their past so i don't think it was a very i, th I think it was quite biased um their take on it because it always comes back to this idea of sustainable animal farming which um, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not, it's not how farming is. Um, so right. yeah, I, I guess. Oh no, please, please, please. Oh no, no. I was just going to say, yeah. So they do, they do, they do address it a little bit, but there's no solutions to it. They don't talk about solutions. And in fact, I've had, I've had lectures make fun of vegans before, uh, which it was just surprising being an environmental major. Yeah. Um, Although I do have like fellow vegans in my, in my classes and stuff, but. Cool. Yeah, this, some, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a really big Harry Potter fan and a really big uh, environmental activist. And she drew the analogy between Voldemort and uh, the Ministry of Magic during uh, like Order of the Phoenix time where it's the hippogriff, it's the hippogriff in the room that nobody wants to address. And they're just like, no, nah, no, nah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You know, the whole kind of environmental community, at least back in the day, was very much like, yeah, we're not going to talk about animal agriculture. We're, you know, it's fine. We're just going to not, not address that. And I found that that analogy very apropos. So it's good to know that it, it's at least being talked about now a little bit more. Yeah, I, it's not talked in most classes. It was one class was actually based on like food systems. So that's why they had to mention it. And my most recent one is on conservation and uh, yeah, conservation organizations. And one was a Marine society and they were the ones who brought up sustainable fishing. Um, so yeah, but I, I do feel that it's the same exact way. It's still the same way. They, they don't really talk about it unless it's a class specifically about food and yeah, I feel like it's kind of taboo still. They don't want to address it. Um, so it's unfortunate. But. Right. Well, thank you. I think a lot of times in, in these discussions, like there's always that, but people in like this population rely on this. And like, that's true. But when we're making these claims, we're not talking about, you know, small indigenous communities or like you said, the Asian population, like communities that rely on fishing. We're talking about, you who can like go to your local supermarket and get, you know, and it's just kind of this, it's sort of under, um, undercuts, I guess the, the, the gravity of the situation when we say that some people rely on specific forms and like, yes, that's true. And I'm not going to argue. I don't think everyone can or should go vegan. I know that's like a big thing, but it depends, you know, and there's, um, these small communities that literally rely on, but there's a big difference between that and then overfishing and somewhere like the UK or the United States that these aren't, um, yeah, it's not necessary. And, uh, and, and the practices aren't done in a sustainable way by any means. So that's a good point too. Um, yeah. So kind of not really, oh, Catherine, did you unmute yourself? 
Just yeah. Um, I mean, just that whole topic um, rings true uh, a lot in, in discourse uh, in Canada, where I'm usually based, um, with, you know, Indigenous populations that live far up north, and so they don't have, you know, access to uh, cheap, fresh food. Um, and so, like, you know, in some communities, a large part of their diet will be um, like sea-based animals. Um, but like, there's this huge misconception about, you know, animal rights and veganism um, where, you know, people throw accusations around like, oh, you wanna, you know, stop them from being able to, to have, you know, nutrition and sustenance and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, um, you know, that's not in particular what the animal rights movement is trying to stop. Um, you know, we we recognize the fact that there are communities that that you know basically don't have any other means of getting food. Um, you know, what we're talking about more, and and I hope people start to realize this is like, um, you know, like factory farming type things, like you know, fish at, fish farms um, or the the Canadian seal hunt, which is not done for any sort of like sustainable reason. Um, and it's like, there's a, there's a huge difference between, you know, a, a community surviving and, you know, pursuing their cultural traditions and um, overfishing in a, uh, an unsustainable way. Definitely. Definitely. Wow. These, I mean, there's so many more questions and topics and everything that, that we could go over and that we want to touch on. And I mean, we can, we'll probably get to a lot of the other things that we want to discuss in, in the later. Um, we have three more of these um, discussions that are going to be really cool. And just also we have the the discord that Tyler's going to drop more information about in the chat later. And, and those are really good places to continue these discussions if, if anyone wants to um, kind of expand on any of this, but um, for now, so the next, um, the next phase um, of our environmental campaign is the Black Lake Challenge um, and why avoiding single-use plastic helps creatures, the planet, and magical people. Um, and then, Valerie, do you want to continue on there? Let's see. Um, well, I, I did want to still ask Charlie um, just the how you, how Trupo Treats is tackling the problem of corporations contributing to so much waste. Um, you've, you've proven that it's possible to do. And how do you feel about like larger corporations? I'm sure it would be pretty complex for them to maybe transfer over, but do you feel like the, like, is it possible? Like how possible would it be for larger corporations to do what you're doing and switch to sustainable packaging and, all of that. I mean, I I would say it's I would say it's doable. I would say the biggest thing that's holding corporations back is just profits. They'll have less lesser profits because they'll have to pay more for the materials because it's not as mainstream yet. But I would say it's it's definitely doable, and we're seeing that um, the packaging doesn't seem to be as expensive as we once thought it was, which is really good to hear. And we're still actually trying to decide between recyclable or compostable. The only thing about compostable packaging is it's less people have less people have the um, accessibility of composting. So we're kind of, but ultimately it's better than recycling because it uses less energy and it puts the material back into the earth. But um, yeah, so we're still trying to decide between that. But I think I think it's definitely possible for these big companies to to manage to do it. I think they just don't want to because first of all, consumers largely don't care unfortunately enough to to buy a more expensive product that has sustainable packaging um so i think it's really hard to say but i think it it does come down to consumer behavior a little bit if people are willing to pay more but then then again also policy is really important in this as well and maybe forcing companies to convert to sustainable packaging i think um i don't think they're going to do it by themselves so yeah I think the more companies who do it it'll end up being cheaper and once they see that there's a demand um it'll become the norm eventually yeah so yeah. so yeah it kind of starts with us and if possible just be more aware of every um everything you buy just the decisions you're making like is there a better 
is there a brand maybe you're not used to that brand but maybe they use recycled packaging already or no packaging um there are bulk stores and we'll talk more about that next time too but there are definitely things that aren't even necessarily that much more expensive you just kind of have to take the time to do the research and like find where you can buy these things so um all right thank you for answering that and um if you're interested in Trupo Treats, go to trupotreats.com and you can pick up some of your own amazing chocolates. I can't wait to see it. I think it'll be in stores one day soon. And uh, you mentioned that you just started this company last July, right? So it hasn't even been a year and you've already come so far and it's just really amazing to watch um, Trupo Treats grow. So congratulations on that, Charlie. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and as Ali mentioned, if you want to continue discussions like this and just be part of our community with the Protego Foundation, you can join our Discord. Um, the link is in the comments and it will be in the description of the video as well. We'd love to have you there. Um, keep an eye out for our next discussion. We're still trying to decide on the time and everything. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate you being here. And um, if you want to know more, just go to our website, CortegaFoundation.org. We have all of this information and more and resources on like uh, how to further your education. And if you learned anything today, just share it with someone you know. Just be like, hey, I learned this cool thing about deforestation. Did you know, you know, like all of the statistics that we talked about. So, um, yeah, we actually made it on time. <laughs> Good job, everyone. Woohoo. It was a great discussion and thank you all for coming. Yeah, thanks Charlie so much. Yeah, I, thank I you Charlie. Like, yeah, for you. <laughs> so it's our early for you. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Sweet. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me as well. I mean, I love your organization and I think what you're doing is awesome. Uh, combining a bit of fantasy with reality, um, trying to solve some issues. I think that's really, really great. So, uh, and I love Harry Potter, so. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a lot coming to me. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.